Hi everyone, welcome to episode 14, which is on radioactivity. Because classes were canceled last week, tier, I know it's so sad, um, we actually had to cancel everything on nuclear and inorganic chemistry, and so we have put together one teeny tiny episode for you on radioactivity to kind of give you just a little bit of a glimpse of what nuclear would have been like. Um, so before I go into it and talk about the actual information and how we use radioactivity and nuclear chemistry in the context of kinetics, I want to give you a brief definition about what something being radioactive is. And so if something is radioactive, it means it spontaneously goes through radioactive decay. So that means you have an unstable isotope that decays into a brand new isotope, which is stable. So this would be like if polonium converted into lead. So for the first time ever, our, we're talking about these atoms where they are changing the number of protons in their core. So up until this point in the semester, we've always been exchanging electrons. And so if you think about your body as an atom, your electrons are going to be your, your gloves or your hat or your jacket, something that you can very easily exchange from one atom to another. But now if we're moving into radioactivity or nuclear chemistry, these atoms can actually give away their protons or change the number of protons that they have in their core, and that's what makes them radioactive. So this would be like if one atom gave its liver or its stomach to another atom. So it's completely different in its identity actually changes. So the example, like I said, is polonium changing into lead. So now in this context, now that we know what radioactive is, what we want to look at as radioactive half-life. So in the last episode, we were looking at what half-life is, which we defined as the half-life is the time required to use up one half of the reactant, right? So we basically said that your new concentration is going to be equal to one half of your original concentration. That's what we're talking about. How much time does it take to get to this new concentration? But what we didn't say is that we could take this one step further because we all know concentration has to do with the number of moles per set volume. Well, the number of moles can really be converted into a mass. And so when we are talking about radioactivity, we can actually imply that our mass can be divided in half as well. So it's one half of the mass. However, there's a caveat to this. We are talking about nuclear chemistry. And in nuclear chemistry, the energy changes are huge when an isotope um, changes the number of protons it has, but the overall mass change is not very big at all. And that's because what's happening is we are losing half of the mass of that one specific isotope. So it's not like you're losing half of the mass of your entire sample, it's half the mass of that specific isotope. So I just wanna put that little disclaimer on there. But what that means then is if we're losing, losing one half of the mass, that actually means we're losing one half of the number of atoms. And the way we quantify that, or the way we talk about that, is we say that we have one half of the activity. Now look at it, it's a capital A, it's not the like cutesy little A we used before in the context of free energy when we were talking about our mass action expressions. So here in uh, nuclear chemistry and kinetics, when we talk about the activity, we're really just talking about a decay rate. So the way we talk about that is counts per second. You might see CPS sometimes or CPM, something like that for counts per minute or disintegrations per second. So two different units that you might see sometimes. So in the t context of nuclear chemistry, notice that I keep putting all these like caveats on. I'm like lawyering you. Like I have to make sure that everything I'm saying is perfectly accurate because we have to have a lot of conditions in order for this to be true. So in nuclear chemistry, when we are talking about kinetics, we are going to say that all radioactive decay is first order. So everything that we've been talking about for the last episodes have been zero, first, or second order. But for this specific topic, it is always, always, always first order. So you can only look at that middle column of the data that I gave you. So radioactive species or their half-lives specifically are constant. We saw that in the last episode. We know that the half-life for something that is first order is going to be the natural log of two divided by your rate constant. That's it. The concentration is not, or does not affect the half-life at all. And so we can't put the concentration in that expression, which means that our half-lives are gonna be constant in every single context of radioactivity or radioisotopes. So a longer half-life indicates a more stable isotope. So if we go all the way up here to something that you might be more familiar with, like carbon-14, we see that it has a half-life of 5,730 years. That is very long, in my, in my opinion. That's a very long half-life. That is way longer than I'm ever going to live. So I would consider carbon to be an extremely stable um, isotope or molecule, uh, not molecule, isotope, yeah. 
So it's extremely stable. But then you can come down here to plutonium and polonium, things that people either use to make bombs or to poison people. And both of these two things are extremely unstable. So it's really hard to use them as either fuel sources or to poison somebody because they are not stable. There's just not much of it around. It immediately decays into another species. Um, to point out here, carbon-14, if you guys are familiar with uh, radioactive decay dating, so carbon dating, you can use carbon-14 to do this. And what they do is they compare the isotopes of carbon-14 to carbon-12 and they decay at different rates. So you can actually look at like a tree and compare the concentration of C12 and C14. And when you look at that comparison, you can actually back calculate to when this tree died and born, it was born and all this stuff. It's really cool chemistry. I wish I had more time to talk to you about it. Okay, so just to give you a quick example, more of a visual, um, if we're looking at our um, sample right here, what we can see is that our radioactive decay is curved as in first order kinetics. We see that we're starting right up here at about a, a value of 100, right? Just to make it simple, we're at 100% of our sample. And then we can see our half-life is 24,000 years. Well, since we're in first order decay, that means that our half-life is going to be constant. It's always going to be 24,000 years. So the next one, 24,000 years, then another 24,000 years, then another 24,000 years. So radioactive um, decay is just another example of first order kinetics, okay? All right, so here's just a sample table for you. You have zero first and second order. Everything is summarized for you perfectly. The only thing we've done is added a really beautiful red box around the first order decay, just so it's very clear in case I haven't said it a hundred times, which I know I already have. Um, it's very clear that radioactive decay always follows first order kinetics. So primarily you're gonna be using this equation if we ever give you any type of nuclear chemistry. That's it, that's the only one you can really use. So now, there are two ways that we can take this information and solve other problems or bigger problems, kind of like what I was talking about before with trying to figure out how old a tree is or something like that. So the amount of isotope remaining after n half-lives is this. Okay, we already gave you this equation in the previous episode. You might have actually learned about it in high school, depending on what type of um, high school experience you had. Um, so there we can plug in our value for n, which is the current number of half-lives, and then determine our new concentration at that specific point. But unfortunately with chemistry and well really anything in science, uh, things aren't perfect. So it's not just like five half-lives have occurred. It's more like 5.372, okay, or something like that. So in that case, we actually have to have a two-step sequence. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to use the equation I showed you earlier, where your half-life is equal to your natural log of two divided by k. And so you are going to have your um, half-life, that part we're already gonna know, and then you can solve for k. So you can solve for your rate constant. Well, once you have your rate constant, since this follows first order kinetics, you can jump right into your integrated rate law, minus kt. So once you have your rate constant, you can come over here <laughs> and plug it in there. And at this point, depending on the context of your question, you can either solve for your new concentration at a specific time, or given a new concentration, you can say, how long will that go? So usually we are given this one, your original concentration, you usually have to star, or star solve for your rate constant, and then once you have these two pieces of information, you can either solve for new concentration or time. So that's basically all I have for you. So what I want you to do is practice this a couple different times. So here's your first question. U-238, or uranium-238, has a half-life of 4.5 billion years. What percentage of the world's uranium will be left when they finish renovating Welch Hall 1 billion years from now? Try it. What percentage? We are looking for a percentage here. So the first thing I'm going to do is realize that we're looking or talking about nuclear chemistry, so it has to be first order kinetics. So I'm gonna jump right into my half-life equation. T1 half is equal to natural log of two divided by K. 
So we have a half-life, 4.5 billion years, and so we're gonna use that to solve for our rate constant. Now, just a little trick, you can put billion years together as like one unit. So I'm gonna come over here and write 4.5 by billion years is going to be set equal to my natural log of two divided by k. So if I use my calculator properly, I can solve for k to be equal to 0 0.154 billion years by. Okay, so now once we have our rate constant, like I said before, we can plug that into our integrated rate law. So you have your natural log of A is equal to your natural log of your initial concentration minus KT. Now we're looking for a percentage. So what percentage? So we're looking kind of for a ratio of A to A naught. But like I told you before, whenever I solve these type of problems with percentage, I like to put the number 100 right here. So we'll do that. Natural log of A, is going to be equal to your natural log of 100. We just solved for K, so we're gonna say 0 0.154 billion years. And then we're going to see our time component one billion years from now. So our, since our unit is billion years, we can just put a one, one billion years here. And if you use your calculator properly, you should be able to solve for your new concentration, which will be equal to 85.7. Now remember, because we didn't use a real number here, you can't say 85.7 molar or anything like that. That doesn't make any sense. But we're set our unit to be percent. So it's 85.7%. Stop right here. Review the question. As soon as it makes sense, then move forward with me. Now we're at a second question. Here. Strontium-90 is one of the most dangerous isotopes released in the Chernobyl di 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 disaster, blah, disaster in 1986. That's the year I was born. It actually happened about one month right before I was born. So a little over a month. Um, it has a half-life of 28.8 years. In what year will 99% of the released strontium have decayed away? Try this one. So we are solving for a year here. In what year will 99% of the released strontium have decayed away? So just like we did before, we're gonna have to use our half-life equation. So T1 half is equal to natural log of two divided by K. Our half-life was given to us at 28.8 years, so we can put that right in there. 28.8 years is going to be equal to our natural log of two divided by K. If you solve for K properly, you are going to get a value of 0.02. Four, okay, because we use our unit years here, we would say we're in a unit of years here as well. All right, now again, first order kinetics. So natural log of A is equal to our natural log of A naught. And then we're gonna subtract out our KT. Now we just solved for our K, our rate constant. We're looking for the year, so we've gotta be solving for our T component. So again, we're gonna to have to figure out what our values of our concentration and our initial, initial concentration are in order to solve for uh, T. I almost said temperature, time. So here we're looking for something at 99% of it has already decayed or has already been released. So we're going to say we're looking for it when it's at 1%. Assuming we started at 100% with a rate constant of 0.024 years, okay? If you do this properly, you can solve for your um, time to be 191 years, but that's not the question. The question asks for in what year will this go through or will 99% of it have already been released into the atmosphere? So what we have to do is go to my birth year 1986 and we're going to add 191 to that and I should be able to do that in my head but I can't so we've got 2177 so probably over a hundred years after I'm dead that's when all the strontium that went into people's thyroids and whatnot and just wrecked havoc on their bodies that's when it will be finally be officially safe to be there because we'll be down to one percent of our strontium now there's obviously a lot more nuclear involved in that um, I gave you just like the tiniest overview um, but I have one more problem for you 
So this is just a preview. I'm not actually going to work it out here because this is going to be what you're going to be doing in your learning exercise. But I want to just point out one thing here. So first, let me read you the problem. A Macombs business student offers to sell you a map to Blackbeard's treasure. He says he knows the map is real because he found it in a recycling bin in the Harry Ransom Center. So if you remember, or sorry, you do remember seeing this slide um, in 302 that a modern paper has a disintegration rate of 15.3 counts per minute. So we set our unit minute. Okay, that's going to be your A naught, your original concentration. And we know that carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. So what you decide to do is you test the map with your pocket Geiger counter, because who doesn't have one of those, and you measure now 15.1 CPM, counts per minute, and technically it should be per gram of paper with a sign. And how old is the paper that the map is written on? Okay, there's your question. Go for it. I know you can do this. I just showed you really the only way to solve first order kinetics problems, so go for it.